Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us online today. I am Julieta Valls Noyes, the Acting Director of the Foreign Service Institute, and I am delighted to introduce today's Heroes of US Diplomacy event. In September, we marked the one year anniversary of the Heroes of US Diplomacy Initiative, through which we have shared six distinct stories of historical and modern day heroes of US diplomacy, shedding light on the contributions made by past and present members of the Department of State's Foreign and Civil Service. Today, we will honor the first locally employed staff members to receive this distinction. And it's fitting that today's event is taking place on November 18th, designated as locally employed staff and Foreign Service National Recognition Day at the Department of State. It is absolutely fitting also that we have so many senior US Department of State leaders joining us virtually today to celebrate our honorees and commemorate this occasion. Ambassador Dan Smith is with us, as are the current U.S. Ambassador in Tunis, Donald Bloom, the former U.S. Ambassador in Tunis, Gordon Gray, the former DCM in Tunis and current U.S. Ambassador in Kampala, Natalie Brown, our Ambassador in Beirut, Dorothy Shea, and Lucia Piazza and Kevin Warriner, the two folks most directly responsible for initially recognizing the heroic work of our nominees. I would like to thank the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its generous support of the Heroes of US Diplomacy Initiative. Thanks to Ambassador Lino Gutierrez, Executive Director of the Cox Foundation, as well as to Cox trustees, Catherine Canavan, Diane Vandemark, and Larry Wood for joining us today. In addition, I'd like to thank our partners in the bureaus of Global Talent Management, Near Eastern Affairs, and Diplomatic Security for partnering with us to bring the stories of Hela and Badia Ladhari to life for today's live program. I'm particularly delighted to welcome today's speakers and colleagues, Acting Assistant Secretary for Diplomatic Security, Todd Brown, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, Joey Hood, and they will introduce our honorees and provide some context for the Ladhari's heroic contributions to US diplomacy. We're also quite honored that the Director General of the Foreign Service, Ambassador Carol Perez, will lead a discussion with the Ladharis to help us understand their stories and their journey. And of course, I am especially pleased to welcome today's honorees, Hela Ladhari and Badia Ladhari, who collectively gave 58 years of service to the US government and to our embassy in Tunis. I'd also like to extend a very special hello from Washington to our colleagues and friends who are joining us remotely from Embassy Tunis. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues, Acting Assistant Secretary Brown and Deputy Assistant Secretary Hood to introduce our honorees. Please know that we will leave 15 minutes at the end of the program for questions and answers, which you can submit via the YouTube chat box. Gentlemen, over to you. Thank you, for, thank you for giving me the opportunity to recognize Budia and Hela Ledhari as the first locally employed staff to be honored as heroes of diplomacy. Today, we salute their dedication to duty under extremely dangerous and difficult circumstances during those fateful weeks in 2012. They demonstrated tremendous loyalty to our embassy and to the relationship between the United States and the Republic of Tunisia. It is my honor to introduce Badia Ladhari. Badia was the lead Foreign Service National Investigator in the Embassy's Regional Security Office when hundreds of angry protesters attacked the U.S. Embassy compound on se September 14, 2012. Kevin Warner, who was regional security officer in Tunis at the time and who nominated Boudia for this award, detailed how Boudia, at tremendous personal risk, helped embassy employees reach safe havens inside the chancery. He then made repeated forays through tear gas, gunfire, and attackers to communicate with host government security forces on behalf of the regional security office and post. 
Having served as a regional security officer in several countries, I am acutely aware of how important Foreign Service national investigators like Budia and others are to the safety and security of our mission personnel. Cultivating and maintaining liaison relationships are important duties of a regional security office and Budia leveraged his local connections to help save lives that day. Despite the diligence of our security forces, threats are ever present. Earlier this year, on the morning of March 6, two suicide bombers blew themselves up as they drove to a security checkpoint outside the US Embassy in Tunis. Their actions killed a police officer who stepped out of his van to speak with them and seriously wounded four others. A locally employed staff member who happened to be driving by was also injured. The response by Tun Tunisian security services was fast and effective, and RSO staff and mission employees also responded calmly and professionally in accordance with their emergency response training. That attack serves as an unfortunate reminder that deadly violence can still occur unexpectedly, but post response by both American and locally employed staff made clear that the legacy of Budia and Hela Ledhari lives on in Tunis. So on behalf of the entire Bureau of Diplomatic Security, I congratulate them on this great honor and join in thanking them for their many years of loyal service. Now, I would like to turn it over to Joey Hood, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. Thank you, Todd. And thank you to everyone for being here today to celebrate the contributions of Hela and Badia Ledhari. I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to the locally employed staff that I know are watching from home in Tunisia. And I would like to share a message on behalf of Ambassador Blom. We are honored that two Tunisians who retired from our embassy are the first locally employed staff members to be recognized as part of the Department of State's Heroes of US Diplomacy Project. Hela and Badia Ladhari, with their dedicated years of service to the US government and the embassy in Tunis, exemplify the heroism, selfless service, and extraordinary contributions of locally employed staff who provide invaluable support every day to advance American diplomacy all around the world. Their courage and resilience while serving during challenging times are an inspiration to all of us." End of quote. Throughout the Middle East and North Africa, locally employed staff are critical to our success in understanding and communicating with host nations. Since establishing diplomatic relations with the newly independent Tunisia in 1956, Tunisian staff have worked alongside our diplomats to strengthen the U.S.-Tunisian partnership and advance our shared goals of security, economic prosperity, and freedom. As the United States supported and continues to support the democratic institution building after the revolution in 2011, Tunisian staff at our embassy were living through that transition. They have shown their unfailing dedication to Tunisian democracy and to the U.S. mission in Tunisia, even when it wasn't easy. I'm not at all surprised that the first locally employed recipients of the Heroes of US Diplomacy Award are members of our team from Tunisia. It's now my honor to introduce Hela Ladhari. Hela served at the US Embassy in Tunisia for 28 years and received the Secretary of State's Career Achievement Award in 2018. She retired as a senior member of the embassy's human resources team. Immediately following the attack in 2012, Hella was the first and only locally employed staff member to be allowed back into the chancery to liaise with the Tunisian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and arrange a special evacuation flight for American staff and their families. The safety and security of our American and locally employed staff is always our top priority, and Hela helped us ensure that. Congratulations, Hela and Badia, on this well-deserved recognition, and thank you 
for your many of service to our mission in Tunisia. I will now pass the virtual baton to the Director General of the Foreign Service, Ambassador Carol Perez, who will speak with Hella and Badia about their heroic actions on and after September 12, 2012. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joey, and good morning, everyone. I am absolutely delighted to participate in this, which is the seventh event in the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy series. And I'd like to thank FSI and the Department Steering Committee for their role in developing this initiative, as well as the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its generous support. This commemoration is especially meaningful for me as Director General because of the first time we are honoring locally employed staff as Heroes of Diplomacy. And fittingly, we do so on LE Staff FSM Recognition Day. So it's a real privilege for me today to help tell the story of Hela and Badia Lethari, a husband and wife team who collectively have devoted 58 years of their professional lives to service to the United States and the US Embassy in Tunis. As you've already heard, the Letharis played critical roles both during and in the immediate aftermath of the attack on the U.S. Embassy in Tunis in September of 2012. And their heroic and selfless actions saved lives, preserved the American flag, and got hundreds of U.S. and Embassy employees, family members, and children out of harm's way and to safety. The Lethardis are very much representative of the courage and the dedication of our more than 60,000 locally employed staff working at US embassy, consulates and presence posts throughout the world. As I noted earlier, today the Department of State and our sister agencies in the foreign affairs community are celebrating locally employed staff or Foreign Service National Recognition Day. It's a day to express our gratitude and appreciation to the largest part of our workforce. And in honoring the Lataris, we are also honoring all the men and women whose expertise, wise counsel, professionalism, and dedication U.S. diplomacy would not be possible to do without them. I can think of no more deserving honorees than Hela, whom I had the opportunity to meet when I went to Tunis in 2015, and Maria, who I just had the opportunity to meet recently, to serve as the first, and hopefully not the last, but the first locally employed staff to be recognized as heroes of diplomacy. I look forward to further recognition of our locally employed staff colleagues contributions in the future. And I'm sure there will be many, many more. So now it is really an opportunity for everyone who is participating today to hear more from, from Hela and from Badia about their uh, experiences. So first of all, I wanna thank both of you for your willingness to take time to do this, to share your story. This Heroes of, uh, of U.S. Diplomacy Initiatives really gives us an opportunity to hear from people about their personal stories, to highlight their achievements, uh, because all employees affiliated with the Department of State have something to contribute, but in this case, something exceptional. We know that our people are our strength, and this initiative underscores that message by telling individual, and in this case, the stories of two individuals uh, behind the many of accomplishments that so many people do every day to support the US people, the American people. So let me start by asking the first question. Tell us what you remember about September 14th, 2012. I know it's been eight years, so it's a little bit of time. I know one of you had gone home because there was a early release for the embassy uh, and the other one had to remain at the embassy. Is that right? That's yes. right. Thank you, Didi Perez. Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you. So tell, tell us both. I would hope that both of you could tell us a little bit about what the impact of that day's events have had on you and your family. But first of all, just a little bit about what happened that day. And Hella, you maybe start because you were the first you had. You were told go home early. Yeah. And then we can have Maria tell us about what happened after you left. Yeah. So I want to first of all, thanks everybody for, for this great moment in our life for this nomination, I want to thank Lucia and all of our colleagues and, and fellows that we work with. Um, 
yeah, let's start by, by the beginning. We, we have had the release and at that time I had the presentiment that something was not good uh, in addition to the fear that I would be leaving the embassy without my husband and I would be leaving the embassy by myself. I thought that it's something that it could be not as, as much as it's going to be. And I was begging to leave with me and to leave the compound and uh, maybe they will call him when, when needed. I was not realizing the, at that moment uh, the big responsibility that we, he would be having and the role that he would be playing and, uh, that day. So you can say that I was a little bit selfish, which is not <laughs> something. And I tried to put my husband and, uh, on the safe side with me and my daughters by staying with us at home. But uh, he totally refused and he was really angry, telling me go home and everything will, will be done and will be there. So this is, this is the, the start. And then I will let him finish the, the, the the second part of the story. Exactly. So, Badia, please, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, uh, on September 13, we get the word from uh, uh, the social media and officially from uh, Ministry of Interior, MOI, Tunisian Ministry of Interior, that there will be uh, another uh, uh, protest in front of the uh, embassy that Friday, the 14th of September 2014. So, uh, on Friday morning, the embassy team get together and talked about what we thought is going to happen and what decision they had that whether they are going to send people home or dismiss or send or dismiss uh, or dismiss. So in that moment, they decided to early dismiss employee. Mm. So the embassy team took, uh, uh, took security precautions such as looking uh, up the gas uh, pump and uh, dispersing some, uh, some embassy vehicles at the uh, US ambassador and at the American cemetery. And there was a heavy police and military presence su surrounding the US embassy perimeter that day. So and I introduced them to the US uh, ambassador, Ambassador Jacob Wallace and to the original security officer, Mr. Kevin Warner. So I do know uh, there was quite, you had quite, um, a few individually heroic efforts that you 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 did, Badiaz. My understanding is you really put your life at risk, did you not? Um, I don't know if anyone on this call has seen the video of what happened during that attack. It is absolutely awful and frightening, and it's amazing how quickly it escalated. And I know you're you're being shy here, Badia, but can you tell us a little bit about some of the risks you took? Because I know you took some significant risks that day. Yes, I remember around uh, around 11 o'clock um, in the morning, protesters started uh, uh, showing up and things uh, uh, very quickly get out of control. So thousands of protesters have gathered, uh, stormed around the uh, US embassy. And uh, no one has imagined that the protesters could breach this safety location until they were able to break into the police line and enter the embassy compound. Mm. So the, uh, the, the Tunisian police are well known for their good coordination and use of force, but they were really unable to control the situation. Definitely this protest was totally the wrong way to act and to express your feeling towards that video. But most of those protests were criminal. They were seeing, taking things from embassy and also from the American school. All of us were super, were, were sure and assumed that the Tunisian government to be there and, pro, and uh, protect the embassy entity as they were supposed to do. But unfortunately, the situation was out of control. Yeah. I tried as much as maintain, to maintain our contact with the police out, outside the embassy, but they were not able to control the situation. My main concern was to save my embassy compound and colleagues. Protesters started to climb the embassy wall. I saw a group of people attempting to take down the American flag, burned it and replaced it with the black terrorist, terrorist one. Without any hesitation, I ran towards them using my gun to spread out the crowd and have and and have the U.S. flag flotate without no damage. And later on, when 
things happen. I was inside the chancery with the Marine, with the RSO, under the instruction of the RSO. I received, I found out from the Marine that one of our USID staff was trapped in the building C outside of the safe haven. So I did not think twice and went straight away to his office and guided him within the terrorist crowd. Which to me is the most amazing part of this story. For those of you who have never been to the embassy in Tunis, at that time, the USAID building was outside of the hard line. So you had an embassy separated by a driveway and then you saw the parked cars that were totally destroyed. And of course, you know, you, you, you really put your life at risk to save one of your colleagues uh, who was just, who was in a very unprotected part of the embassy compound. Um, and, and also the fact that you went and saved the American flag is, is just really an incredible story by you because you know, as we know, flags mean so much to us. They are representative of every, every, everything that we are as people, as a nation. Um, and I, and I just can't overemphasize uh, that that level of courage that you took in the face of you know incredible demonstrators. And as you as you mentioned, you know there could have been the demonstrators would have had. Um, you know, different kinds of people engage as often happens, right? You have people that are not there for the cause, but they're troublemakers, but it didn't make any difference because they were really out there to destroy. And you saw from what we just saw that they did major destruction. And yet yeah. you didn't hesitate, didn't think twice. You were told, listen, we have somebody who's at risk and you put yourself at risk to get that person to safety. And, and, and again, I can't overemphasize that, you know, that is to me the true definition of being a hero is when you really think to do that. So I just want to thank you. You're being very modest here. And, <laughs> I, and I know that you have no reason to be modest because it was actually something that um, most people don't have that experience in their lives, thank God, but you, you did the right thing and you took care of your colleagues. And of course, as I said earlier, there's nothing more important than people in our organization and you put people first. So I just can't thank you enough for everything that you've done. It's a really really amazing story, but it doesn't stop there because as we said, so Helen went home and I'll talk to you a little bit, of, I'll ask you a question a little bit about what that impact had on your, on your family, but you then the next day were the person who then did the same thing. Once we now have, uh, we've had this terrible incursion, we've had this terrible demonstration and all of a sudden now we need to get people out. So can you talk a little bit about what happened then and who called you and, and how you managed to come back in and, and sort of relate to your experience of trying to get so many people out so quickly to get them out of harm's way? Okay. <laughs> yeah, about, about video or about myself? About yourself, about what you did. Okay, just I was, while I was watching everything on news and, and waiting for, for, the, for the good news to be back, uh, I was really uh, as trapped in my house while watching everything live through the, the, the Al Jazeera and through the TV. And uh, from the 3 uh, p.m. Uh, that, that day of the attack till 6 uh, uh, the following day, I was just uh, turning around and, and uh, fe having fear that uh, my colleague, my husband, or uh, any of our our uh, ambassador FS, ambassador the FSOs will be will be really uh, alarmed or having something that uh, happened uh, happened to them or to their family, so we were just uh, waiting for the for for this Berber attack to be over and and uh, uh, act uh, accordingly to to have everything on the safe side and have everybody saved and everybody. Um, well, at the, at home. So this is this is what was really the major 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 concern for me, and I think same thing for Badia. Yeah. yeah, and so I know that often unsung heroes work in places like the HR section of an embassy, right? Um, yes. It's a lot of you know very important work, but it's not the kind of thing where people think about what you do every day and what your colleagues do around the world. This case you and the work that you did was so instrumental in making sure that our diplomats and their families and their children could get out quickly and allow the experts, people like Bahia and others to really, and the political experts, the ambassador and the DCM and others at the time 
to really uh, work to come to, uh, to some solution in this very, very tense moment. So again, I know that what you did was absolutely amazing. Uh, it's not easy to do this. You know, we have, this is the kind of thing that you don't do on a regular basis. So it's not like you wake up in the morning and say, I need to evacuate 400 people today. And what do they need and how are we gonna do this? And of course people are nervous and they're afraid and they're, and they're scared and they don't know where they're gonna go. And to leave that quickly is really, really tough. So I only wanna thank you because I know that because of your calm presence and the fact that you were able to do this so quickly and, and so successfully really meant that these families, that those who stayed behind knew that their families were gonna be taken care of. Yep. And those that left knew that they were going to be able to leave without any harm. And I, and again, I think that's just such a, a wonderful thing that you were able to do. So let me ask both of you though, this was a really, um, I would expect sort of a once in a lifetime experience, right? Not many people go through something like this. No. What kind of, what kind of effect has these, has this event had on both of you personally? And then you mentioned your daughters on your family. So telling you the truth, Gigi Perez, uh, for me, it was really a big shock. I, I was not expecting that this kind of attack would happen uh, in my country, to my embassy, it's, it's to my home. So uh, we as Tunisians, we were well known as being so joyful, so peaceful. We were, we were uh, uh, open-minded people. We were tolerated. We, we are open to different generation to, to different uh, civilizations so we were i was not really uh, thinking even a second that this attack would be coming from my people from my tunisian fellows so i was shocked and at that time i was uh, having the hijab and uh, i was uh, putting the hijab and i took it right away uh, i was not uh, uh, able to to uh, and uh, to to be compared or be part of those barber and terrorists because our islam it's totally different uh, we we need to be tolerant we need to be open to uh, everybody our prophet muhammad was really in a good shape with all the religion we were, he was tolerant and he was uh, uh, living in peace with everybody so this is this is something that really uh, turn around to me to another chapter in our life and tell you, telling you the truth at that moment uh, inside me and after that after that we discuss it with Badia and the girls we have decided to move to the United States to give to my girls good uh, life style good good opportunity for studying for for living for for having a uh, uh, better job uh, opportunities and better life so till everything will go back to normal maybe after that they will be go back home and do what they need to do to to have tunisia back to normal again so this is what, what the turnover of what what gone on after the test after this attack yeah and that's an actually um i can only imagine how difficult that must have been for you because it is part of you know to have a, to have a a, an external personality, uh, you know, an external way of looking, and then to change that must have been very, very difficult. difficult. But yeah, what about you? The same. What what kind of impact has this had on you as well? So for me, as a as a um, FSNI, uh, I have a lot of contact with people or with with police. And uh, uh, after this um, this attack, it, it was uh, really uh, difficult for us uh, as uh, as FSNs because we are. Some of, some of us we are we are targeted because we work at the US embassy. So some people and even me when the the video for the flag it was published on the internet and I was like mm. they put me as wanted for more than a month. It was in the in the in the, in the Facebook. So it, it's not easy. So but you know I'm I'm uh, well known in, in Tunisia, especially with Minister Fantero with our contact. I maintain a good contact with, and this is. Uh, with the, uh, under the uh, direction of the regional security officer, so uh, I, uh, I I come to the embassy uh, every every day, and uh, during that uh, attack, I spend nights at the embassy more than a week. I spent it with the uh, with the MSD uh, uh, and with the RSO, so we did we did a great job. But this is an, uh, to to uh, to compare in in my uh, life, it was it was really uh, difficult and dangerous during during that time. But uh, 
because I'm I'm well known and people know me, so uh, it, it was it was really a, a, a good uh, coordination with MOI. So we worked together for all the with the with the embassy and with or out of the embassy, and uh, it was it was good. It was good. Well, and you know, I, I I'm struck by the fact that you are a security professional, so you're somebody who normally is thinking externally about every everybody you need to keep safe every piece of property you need to keep safe and in this case you were the one that needed to be kept safe because you were out there as a symbol of somebody who perhaps wasn't supporting uh the the the, the demands of the of the protesters you were supporting the u.s government and so how ironic that somebody who devoted their whole professional life to security now finds himself in with insecurity and and I can only imagine and my next question is a little bit personal but I have three children and now a little granddaughter and you talked about your children and I would just love to you know hear about what impact they might have had on them because I think sometimes when we are on these these difficult jobs of diplomacy um, we just expect that our families are going to to think of these as being very positive you know which they are most of the time but, you know, I'm just curious about, I know you said you, you know, the decision come to the U.S. was made after this, but uh, talk a little bit about the impact on your family, because I always am interested, you know, after the fact, what did I do? What did my, what did my family experience, you know, beyond what we do? We are adults. We work in that environment. We understand it a little bit differently than our children would. So please. At the time, they, they were, they were. On, on the teenager age, but the, the, mm. we try to keep them uh, aside. We, we try to protect them from what is going on, and uh, we try to keep them on the secure uh, side of, of of the situation as much as we can. And uh, they, they they were not at that time. I was really afraid that they would be by themselves outside, even though they go to school. I mean, I try to be on time to keep, to take them back home, and same thing. Uh, with Bedia, so uh, our life go through the the struggle of keeping them uh, on on the on the safe side by letting them live a normal life, which is what what not not really easy for for yeah. both of us. And at that time, Bedia was most of the time working. I was by myself because he was at one hundred at twenty four seven with the embassy, trying to be on demand with the, with the, with the security uh, staff and with all his colleagues. I, I try to be both their their father and their their mother, but it, it was easy with his help and my family also helped me a lot. And uh, it was something that all of us, as LE staff and uh, the, the episode that remain at the embassy, were going through, and it was a, a tough time. It, but at the end, it was over with the help of everybody, with the with understanding of our. Our uh, ambassador, our DCM, uh, Miss Natalie Brown, she was so helpful and present also at that time. And everything went well after that. But it was hard for everybody, I think, for all of us, all of us. Yeah. I, again, it's, I think sometimes children don't realize that the world is very complicated and sometimes there's hatred that has nothing to do with reality, but it just exists. And, and yeah. what a shock to have something like this happen where your parents are working. Uh, and to see that kind of anger um, is really, really tough. So I know, as we mentioned, together, 58 years of service, which is absolutely incredible. And I want to thank you again for your dedication. But I'm hoping that we can put on the screen now, there is a, there is a picture of the two of you embracing. And, you know, if you're looking uh, onto the, what is the facade of the embassy at the time following the attack. And maybe you can tell us just a little bit about what you were what you were thinking about in that moment. So the two of you together, and, and again, yet looking at all this destruction. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, during the attack, I spent the night uh, at the embassy and uh, out of my uh, my house and my home. And uh, my uh, my wife, she was she was uh, she tried to call me, and I cannot pick up the phone because I was really busy with what happened. And she she was she was scared why she didn't respond to the phone. So she she had to talk to other colleagues at the safe haven, and they told her that he's he's okay, but he's uh, really here. So. So uh, uh, on that uh, on that moment, I was I was I was really really busy, and I was I can I cannot answer the phone. But uh, the 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 following morning, she came to the uh, to the uh, to the embassy, and she was shocked because she she saw she saw those uh, 
uh, burning cars and uh, yeah. this, uh, it's it's really shocked. So she get she get shocked. So she hang, uh, she uh, she hugs me and I I, I hug her and it was really a good moment to to see my my wife again because I was putting my my uh, myself in danger and I was thinking I'm, I'm gonna gonna die. One one of the moment I'm I'm thinking I'm, I'm gonna die because what what I saw outside it's 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 really it's really uh, unbelievable. These it's people. Horrible. Yeah, it's like war. These people, they are they, they came to to kill us. They're not coming to protest. So it's uh, this uh, this they are criminals. Most of them are criminals. So uh, it was really uh, a good moment when I when I met my wife uh, after right after the the attack and uh, she saw all all this uh, uh, disaster at, at the at the embassy and what they what they wrote on the wall. They wrote a lot of. Uh, uh, bad words like you killed Beledem, we have a thousand of Beledem, and uh, yeah, um, they that's 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 uh, uh, that's not the way how how to protest, and uh, it's not it's shame, it's shame on that day. But uh, finally, I find my wife and my uh, my family yes, after after this attack. Uh, everybody was saying that's the most important thing for yeah. me. Yeah. And for me, I was I was thankful to God that uh, none of none of us, none of our colleagues, none of the FSOs or my husband or my my any staff were killed. Uh, and uh, thanks God, I was happy that they are there. And it was only uh, the, the 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 compound damage. Nothing was really important than than the, their lives. So I was so happy at that moment. But I was not really. Uh, thinking one that this embassy, this this big entity, the the, the the big place that will never be attacked, was in, the, in such a disaster uh, way. It, it's like it's like I was going through a chaotic and, and nightmare. It was it was it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. You cannot. I will never never uh, hope that this could happen or be a, a life a life experience to any of of uh, of you. And uh, yeah. thank God, always also because the they, they get attacked the uh, American school, and thank God the uh, the yeah. uh, the students are not there. Are not so there. They, yes. They, they, uh, yes. They dismiss. So uh, they they stolen everything and they burn everything at the school. So this is this is not good. It's it really shocked, really shocked me as well. Yeah. And thank God the student they're not there. Thank God. That's yeah. right. That's mm -hmm. right. DJ Perez, I want to thank most of all Mr. Kevin who let me go through the, the embassy, even though it was it was shut down. And I want to thank Lucia Piazza who has taken this picture that we have we will have memorized all what we have been through. So thanks to them that I was allowed to be at the embassy, the first early staff that was allowed to be at the embassy after the attack. Yeah. Thank you so much. No, and I'm glad they're able to join us today. Uh, it's oh, yeah. because of their efforts that you're that you're here. And I know I want to leave time for questions, but before I do that, let me just ask you one last question. So this award uh, is available to anybody that works in a in the state department. So you could be a locally employed staff member, civil service, foreign service, family member, uh, contractor. So anybody can be nominated to be a hero of diplomacy. And I, and I encourage those that are with us today to think about people like Lena Harris who have really done so much for our people, for our, our institution, for the American people and to nominate someone for this award. So let me just ask you, what does this award mean to both of you? And, and uh, let me, Helen, I'll start with you first. You know, I, I was uh, the person who was distributing the award. I was in charge of the award ceremony at, <laughs> at the embassy. So now being the first Ali staff to be recognized and receive this very honorable award. And uh, it's, it's such an honor and such a, a, something that you can, I was never think that I will be part of receiving this, this award. And this will be uh, also, uh, we will be part of it uh, to, to all of our LE staff all over the world. And uh, especially I want to thank my, my LE staff uh, that work with me, the Tunisian staff that work with me and for, 
for being part of this world. I will be sharing it with them also. So it's a great honor for me. And uh, my advice to all of the, 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 the any staff around the world to have the chance uh, and work as, as hard as they can and uh, share their knowledge and always say yes to any uh, uh, adventure or any new way of doing their work. This is, this is my advice to all of them. Thank you. Faria. Uh, we, have, we have received many honors awards during uh, oh. our long career and we are uh, grateful uh, for them. But being nominated and uh, rec recognized for the uh, bureaus of US diplomacy as the first LES uh, staff worldwide is the highest uh, award that well ever received and uh, dreamed of. And that has been the privilege and honor of serving very uh, proudly the American Embassy to Tunis, Tunisia. Well, I, I just personally want to thank both of you. I am so glad that I had an opportunity to meet you, Badia, to help to reconnect with you after after some years. I, I can just tell you that um, throughout my career, I know I never could have been anywhere as successful or have accomplished anywhere near as much as I did without the support of our, our local staff. Um, when people ask me, you know, how what when I talk to incoming. Um, FSOs, they asked me, how do I be successful? I said, you take the time to sit down at the beginning and talk to the local staff because they're going to tell you things you would otherwise never know. No matter how much you read, no matter how much you study, it's not until you actually live in a country and you have the ability to talk to people who are citizens of that country to really understand what it is to work there. And I want to thank both of you on behalf of the 60,000 local staff members we have all over the world. And I am so delighted we're able to do this today on recognition day, uh, because you two do embody everything that I think is the best of our, of our wonderful local staff throughout this world. I often say it would be hard for me to work for a foreign country. I can only imagine how tough it's been for, to, for both of you and over so many years, but you did it and you did it in such an incredibly, um, an incredible way that you gave your lives, you gave your, you gave everything to us and, and to the, and to the embassy. And I can't thank you enough, but with that, I want to leave time for questions. So let me now turn this over back over to ambassador noise. And she is going to um, engage with our audience. So thank you. Thank Great. you. Well, um, to everyone watching, I, I don't know if this has affected you as much as it has me, but that's been very, very powerful hearing your stories and seeing your photographs, but it appears that people are being affected because we are getting a lot of questions in the chat box. And I'd like to encourage people to continue to submit those questions. We have questions for both of you, Helen Badia, and also um, Ambassador Perez, we have some questions for you, but let me kick it off first with the first question for, um, for Hela and Badia. Um, as you know, a lot of your colleagues from the U.S. Embassy in Tunis are joining us today and are watching mm -hmm. today. And I wanted to ask, or one of our viewers wants to ask, if you have any special message for them today. For me, it is uh, uh, keep up the, the, the good work, uh, try to be as joyful as we were together, uh, and try to work as a team. Uh, and uh, be be selfish about almost all what you are doing with uh, others, and listen and uh, try to share your 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 experience and uh, and uh, do your best to, to keep up the, the good work and try to have Tunis Ali staff uh, as heroes and shining for all all the rest of the of, of the time. This is this is my advice. For me, I miss them. <laughs> and I miss Tunisia and want to say to them, keep up the good work. I know we have a good team and a good, good uh, uh, presence in uh, US Embassy Tunisia. And take, take care of yourselves and uh, keep the good work. Thank you okay. very much. Great, great. So Carol, maybe um, I'll have the, the next question is for you. And that question is, what projects or efforts are underway now in order to effectively recognize and honor the service of locally employed staff around the world? People like the Ludharis who serve at our, at our posts overseas. What, uh, what are we doing at the Department of State to recognize? 
these these critical members of our team? Yeah, so <laughs> thank you for that question. Uh, you know, it, it when um, I came back um, just a little short of two years ago, one of the things that really struck me was how uh, many local staff did not know people uh, very well in the regions. So for example, I was talking to one of my local staff members when I was ambassador in Santiago and I, we were discussing an issue and I said, why don't you call your colleague at the embassy in Buenos Aires? And you know, it's like an hour by plane right over the Andes. And she said, well, I don't know anybody there. And it really struck me as how could this be? Because even though we, even though we do offer training, we seldom have the opportunity to bring our local staff together to talk about other kinds of issues, just to start networking, to get to know each other. So um, a little over a year ago, we started regional conferences uh, and we are going to finish the last one in December with our European colleagues. That one was delayed because of COVID, because of the pandemic. But we have one representative from every embassy in a region. We get together for two days and we talk about um, issues that are common in the regions. Uh, we talk about empowerment. We talk about communication. Uh, we, we look at best practices. But the whole idea is to have a network. So that, in, so that groups of local staff in embassies in a certain region would be able to discuss issues and ideas together. Now we are rolling out a, a local staff uh, advisory council that will advise me and my team about issues that we need to pursue in the future. So it may be it's more professional development. It could be it's uh, talking about how to communicate better because I do think that's still a, an issue when we have local staff working for dozens and dozens of agencies. But because of this conversation I have with the local staff, we are really looking for ways to set up networks and to really have that connectivity. Super, well, I can just add to that, that here at the Foreign Service Institute, we're also taking a look at training opportunities for our local staff. So we look forward to contributing to your efforts. Okay, so the next question, and I have to look over here in the, in the chat box because there are so many. The next one then is for Badia and Hella. And that question is, after serving all of those years at our embassy in Tunis and, and giving so much of your life to service to the embassy there, you moved to the United States. What's been the most surprising thing? What has, um, what has surprised you the most about life in America? <laughs> okay, so for us, it's like we, we start from scratch. Everything you need to, you need to start everything from bottom and do another career and, and try to build yourself as if you have never done any career before that. So it's all, you need to put everything back and try to do it and, and build your career and your life from the, from the bottom to, to the top and try to be patient and, uh, and positive. This is, this, is my, this is how I find life in, in the United States. And at the end, we will get recognized. This is, this is the, 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 the great part of it. And uh, this, is, this is how uh, being recognized after those years with the embassy. So I hope that we'll, this will happen to all of other fellows of our Elise, uh, Elise staff colleague that move or think to be moving to the United States with their special immigrant visa. Yeah, and we started a new chapter of our life. It yeah. was uh, what we did at the US Embassy. Now when we came here, so it's gone, nothing. So we have another job, we have another life. We have uh, uh, our daughters who to go to the university. It's not easy. So we, we start from the beginning and uh, we survive, it's good. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. All right, I've got another one for the Director General. Can you recount, Carol, a particularly memorable episode from your own career, which captures the indispensable nature of the contributions made by locally employed staff to the promotion of US diplomacy? Actually, there's so many that it's almost hard to, to think about one in particular. Um, but let me tell you, this is something I think that uh, local staff around the world appreciate. So we do a lot of VIP visits, right? We support the president and the vice president and um, all sorts of dignitaries coming to visit us. Uh, and I, we were, uh, I was in Santiago and uh, we were having an issue with uh, how to get a, the, a government aircraft 
into a commercial airport. So Santiago doesn't have military bases with airports. So it's actually the commercial airport in Santiago. And it was really, 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 really complicated. And we had been trying everything. I had all of my defense attache colleagues working on this. I had talked to the chief of the Air Force um, and I had one local staff member and her name is Lily. And Lily had the Rolodex, like she knew everybody in the country. And I had even talked to the foreign minister about this. And Lily somehow knew the person on the president's staff. They, it, it, for there, the, the sort of the West Wing was called the second floor, the secondo piso. She mm -hmm. knew the person to call to get the clearance, to get the plane in, where we needed it, at the time we needed it. And I will never forget that because I realized that as much as I may have the title or my defense attache had the title, you need somebody who really knows people and knows how to work the situation. And she was that person. She was the person who could, if it wasn't her herself, she got me uh, as ambassador or somebody else in the mission to the right place to make things happen. And I know that wasn't a life-threatening issue, but had we not done that, believe me, there would have been all sorts of issues. And in fact, everything went seamlessly because again, she had the magic Rolodex. And, and again, she did a lot of other amazing things, but I often thought to her, boy, I there's always that one go-to person in the embassy and she was that go-to person. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I'm sure all of us, all of us foreign service officers and foreign service specialists who are watching have our own lilies in the past and and, uh, and our own lilies in the present. So we are so grateful to all of them. Okay, the next question is for Badia and Hella again, and it's about resilience and resilience during a crisis. And the question is this, Badia and Hella, how did you spend your days after the attack? What did you do to recover? How did you re regain your sense of sort of calm and your family life in those in those days after that tragic attack? For, for me, to be honest with you, I spend all the time at work. After, right after the attack, so I spend nights and nights at work. So I, I'm, during the day, we, we work our regular work, that, that, uh, um, the contact with the Minister of Interior, the um, uh, investigation, and uh, we protect the US ambassador. So we, we, um, I was busy and uh, I'm not going home. So. Uh, Maybe Hela, she, she can answer this, this question. You know, for, for us, uh, after the, the, the attack, uh, the, having our normal life was impossible because uh, the, our work was not the same. Our work hours are, are totally different. We were working uh, remotely or when, uh, like me and my other, some of our, my other early staff who were able to, to attend the embassy, we were really uh, afraid that something will happen. So, but after that, by the time we get used to it and uh, for me, the, the recovery was leaving it with my family and my daughters and concentrate to give better to my to my daughters and uh, try to do hard to, and have my work as as good as I can. And we had uh, each other and we were, we, our teamwork was was stronger at that time. It's like it's revenge for what happened to the embassy. We need to keep the work going and we need to have the embassy and our life back to normal. And it's our revenge to tell them that nothing could stop us for doing our job. Wow, so you relied on your colleagues. Yes. Your work, oh, doing your job well, yeah. taking care of your family. Yes. Reaching out to each other and, and, and using that network to, to rebuild your resilience and, and rebuild a, a new sense of normal. I try to be as positive, positive as we can. Nothing, nothing, nothing could work except that. Wow, wow. Well, such an amazing, amazing <laughs> story. So let's see, we have other questions, so many questions here. So um, one of the first questions you sort of spoke to originally, but let me ask you to go a little bit deeper and um, ask you about the decision that you made to, to move to the United States and about the effect that the events of September 2012 played on that decision. You've talked about how hard it was and how you, you felt a sense of, of needing to, um, to rethink all of the things that you had considered for, for the years that you worked at the embassy. But um, 
it's still a very big decision to leave your country and settle in a new country. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you how you came to that decision, please? You know, I'm telling you the truth, it was not uh, an easy decision. Uh, it was hard, it was difficult, but when you think about the balance and the, 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 the positive part that you are going to give to your daughter, and uh, have, giving them uh, a, a better opportunity till everything will go back to normal in my country, then uh, you, can, you can say that it's worth to, to, to try and to start again uh, and from, from scratch. Because uh, our country was, and till now is not the country that it used to be before the attack and before what is going on right now. Uh, everything's still still working to 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 have it uh, as as calm and as uh, as good situation as as we uh, it should be, but uh, it was not it was not a, an easy decision. It was hard, but uh, we have taken uh, <laughs> taken it together, uh, and my 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 kids has helped us a lot. Because they are having the 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 the, the, the hope, and uh, that everything will be better uh, soon. And at that time, after that day, they have the, the appropriate uh, uh, knowledge, appropriate uh, career experience. Then maybe they can go back and and try to have Tunisia, the Arab Switzerland, as it used to be called before. So I see that we're running out of time, but you just mentioned a word that I wanted to ask about for the last question. And I'm sorry, people in the chat box, but the last question comes from me. After everything that you've been through and everything that you've seen, and after this terrible 2020 that we have been through, yes. what gives you hope? Such, such recognition, such honor. Uh, tomorrow it's always uh, uh, better and for sure uh, life should be with good and bad experience and by your bad experience that you learn to uh, to move on and uh, and have strength and have hope that uh, uh, tomorrow it's it's always be shining and tomorrow is always uh, a better day that's lovely but do you have do you want to share with us what gives you hope Yes, uh, I hope everything goes back to normal because of that, this pandemic and what happened uh, all over the world. So I hope I hope everyone will be would be good and will be back to normal. And I hope I hope the good for my family, for my for my daughters, and for for my future. This is a new a new chapter life for me for my family. So uh, I hope we be in, in the best situation. Well, thank you so very much, and I think Badia and Hella, everyone who's watched today would say back to you that watching people like you and hearing your stories are what give the rest of us hope. So on behalf of everyone, I, I wanna thank you all um, with this, for this amazing program. That does conclude our virtual program today. I wanna thank you for this fascinating discussion. Thank you to everyone who tuned in for the event. For people who would like to know more about the Heroes of US Diplomacy Initiative, you can visit state.gov heroes slash heroes of US diplomacy, or you can also follow the hashtag heroes of US diplomacy on social media. Thank you all so very much again, and I wish everyone a wonderful remainder of their day. Thank Bye -bye. you.